Hello and welcome to today's lesson on stellar evolution, which is part of the astrophysics topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at how to draw a life cycle for an average sized star. So if we're being successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to determine the part of the stellar life cycle from the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, understand the stellar evolution of a sun-like star from formation to white dwarf, and then understand how a sun-like star moves around the HR diagram as it evolves. So this links to the following part of the AQA A-Level Physics Specification 3.9.2.5, the Hertzsprung-Russell Diagram. Now, the development of the Hertzsprung-Russell Diagram showed that stars evolve throughout their life. Now, we can separate the stellar evolution of a star into different parts, which is revision from GCSE Physics. So the Sun and all stars begin life as gas and dust in a nebula cloud. So the first stage of a star's life cycle is the nebula stage. So hydrogen is found in areas of deep space after the Big Bang. Now, remember that hydrogen nuclei were produced in the Big Bang. So a collection of hydrogen gas in the universe is called a nebula. Now, the original name for nebulae were planetary nebulae as we thought this was where planets were formed. Now this was ultimately wrong but the name stuck so there are no um, there are no planets found in a planetary nebula. Now a nebula is a very cold region of space so the gas molecules inside the nebulae move very slowly so the denser clumps of the cloud contract very slowly under the force of gravity. So gravity forces the hydrogen gas into a sphere and this is called a protostar. Now as the particles are are moving so slowly, gravitational attraction takes over and pushes the particles together to form a sphere. Now we call this sphere a protostar. So the first stage is planetary nebula, the second stage is the protostar. Now, the next thing is that as the clumps of hydrogen and helium come together, the density of the area increases and therefore the particles hit into each other more. So this causes the sphere to heat up. Now, this means that the temperature is increasing inside the protostar. However, it's still too cold to carry out nuclear fusion. Now, just to clarify, gravity forces the hydrogen into a sphere as this is the most stable shape in the universe. Now, eventually, the temperature and the pressure of the protostar increases so much so that the fusion begins. Now at this point the protostar becomes a star. So the star starts to release radiation via fusion. Now this creates a radiation pressure to stop the gravitational collapse that was taking place in our protostar. So when a star carries out hydrogen fusion we say it is in its main sequence. So the first stage is a planetary nebulae, the second stage is the protostar, the third stage is the main sequence. Now it's important to know Note that we can see now the where the star appears on the HR diagram. So we can see the main sequence of our star. Now a star spends most of its life on the main sequence. So during the main sequence, hydrogen is fusing together to form helium. Now during this process, the mass before is greater than the mass afterwards. So this tells us that the mass of the hydrogen nuclei is greater than the mass of the helium nucleus. So this occurs because some of the mass of the hydrogen turns into energy. This energy is released as electromagnetic radiation from the star. Now the principle which describes this is E equals mc squared. Now on the main sequence star, there are two forces which act on it. The first force is the gravitational attraction produced by the mass of the particles in the star. Now this acts inwards. Now as well as that, the fusion pressure force produced by the products of the fusion escaping from the star acts outwards. Now in the main sequence, we know that the fusion fusion pressure acting outwards is equal to the gravitational attraction acting inwards. So this means that there's no overall force on the star, so the star remains stable in its main sequence. Now, this means that larger stars will have to have a greater rate of fusion compared to smaller stars. Now this occurs because larger stars will need that greater fusion pressure to balance out the greater gravitational attraction found in the star. So what this means is that larger stars spend less time on the main sequence than smaller stars. So because the Sun is quite a small star, it will spend a very long time on the main sequence compared to other stars. Now in a main sequence we know that the 
star is very stable and unchanged due to the balancing of these forces. Now this stage can also be called the core hydrogen burning stage. Now when the hydrogen eventually runs out, the heavier elements begin to fuse and this causes the star to expand into a red giant. So our fourth stage in stellar evolution is our red giant stage. Now you notice on our Hertzsprung russell diagram, it will move from the central area of the diagram to the top right hand corner. Now it's important to note that in red giants, fusion of elements larger than hydrogen takes place. Now this is very, very important because what happens is as follows. When all the hydrogen in the core has fused into helium, nuclear fusion stops and with it the fusion pressure decreases. Now when all the hydrogen in the core has fused into helium, nuclear fusion stops and therefore this will cause the core of the star to contract and heat up. This increases the temperature of the core. So this makes the star hot enough to carry out fusion of helium and the heavier elements. Now this will increase the size of the star as the fusion pressure force is now much larger than gravity. Now so it's important to note that in red giants fusion of elements larger than hydrogen takes place. This increases the fusion pressure as larger fragments are pushing outwards. So the star increases in size and becomes a red giant. Now it's important again to note the temperature of a red giant is lower than a main sequence star as even though it produces a great amount of energy, there is a greater area so the energy is more spread out, as shown by the equation P equals sigma AT to the 4. Now as the surface area of the star is much larger, to maintain a constant power output, the temperature must be lower. Now. More, more energy is needed to fuse larger elements together as there's a greater repulsion between them. This is because larger elements have more protons, so have a greater positive charge, leading to a greater repulsion between the nuclei. So the energy found in a star is proportional to its core temperature. Now stars of average mass like the Sun only have enough temperature and energy in their core to fuse up to carbon. Now there's not enough energy to fuse elements larger than carbon in average stars they're just not hot enough but actually stars will carry out shell fusion of elements now in reality a red giant will have several fusion processes taking place simultaneously so how it works is as follows you've got a core and you've got shells of fusion burning carrying out between them so the fusion of heavier elements takes place in the core as it requires a larger pressure since the nuclei have a greater positive positive repulsion now the fusion of lighter elements takes place in the outer layers as it requires a lower pressure since the nuclei have a smaller positive positive repulsion. Now in addition to this, the radiation released from the fusion in the core heats up the outer layers to allow the temperature in this part of the star to be high enough to carry out fusion. So just to clarify, stars contract, heat and then fuse successively bigger nuclei in its structure. So fusion in the core of a star is called core burning, whilst fusion in the outer layers of a star is called shell burning. So you can have core burning in the centre here, while shell burning occurring in layers on the outside of this. Now it's interesting to note that when the sun will go red giant, uh, the earth and the inner planets will be destroyed by the increase in mass and the sun will stay like this for up to 100,000 years. Now it's important to note that when fusion stops, uh, the temperature and pressure okay, will obviously decrease but the outer layer drifts off and a white dwarf is formed. Now the outer layers of the star are released to form a new nebulae to start the cycle. Now this occurs as the core temperature of the red giant is not not large enough to fuse heavier elements together. So this causes the star to shrink under its force of gravity. Now this makes the shell of helium around the outside unstable and this eventually means that shell is ejected. So that will then lead to the outer layers being removed and blown off to start the new cycle. Now the core of the star will eventually stop shrinking and contracting due to something called electron degeneracy pressure. Now this is basically when electrons repel each other as they must exist in shells okay so this stops the atoms contracting further so this leads to a white dwarf forming in the following part of our stellar evolution cycle now this full movement it can be observed on the hertzsprung russell diagram where you've got stage one with your main sequence star you've got stage two when it becomes a red giant and then stage three when it becomes a white dwarf
Now, this white dwarf is a core of carbon left behind after fusion. Now, this is can be considered a core of diamond because it's, it's carbon under high pressure and temperature. Now, it's important to know that the white dwarf is like the hot embers after a fire and this dwarf will cool down for a long time as energy is being lost to space. Now a white dwarf must have a high temperature as this is shown in the equation P equals sigma A T to the 4 because if the surface area has decreased dramatically then the temperature must increase dramatically to maintain a constant power output. Now eventually the white dwarf cools down until it forms a black dwarf. This happens as Radiation is lost to space from the white dwarf. Now, black dwarfs have never been observed in the universe, so black dwarfs are purely theoretical objects. Now, black dwarfs would be in thermal equilibrium with space, so it would be very, very cold. Now, black dwarfs have never been observed in the universe because they are very small, dim, and exert little gravity, so cannot be easily observed. And in addition, we believe the universe has not existed for enough time for a black dwarf to cool from a white dwarf. So let us look at the different stages of stellar evolution. We have the nebulae, the protostar, the main sequence, the red giant, the white dwarf and the black dwarf. Now we should be able to understand in our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram the main sequence, the dwarfs and the giants, understand the axis scale range in a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, both for the absolute magnitude and the temperature slash the spectral class, and should be able to understand the path of a star similar to our sun on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram from formation to white dwarf. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to determine the part of the stellar life cycle from the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, understand the stellar evolution of a sun-like star from formation to white dwarf and understand how a sun-like star moves around the hertzsprung russell diagram as it evolves. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on stellar evolution which is part of the astrophysics topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching and as always have a lovely day.